Um, so today is one of two days. Um, we are taking the opportunity to last school year, and we'll get a lot more deep, you know, we'll get deeper into this. I did a listening and learning tour when I came to Worcester Public Schools. Um, the existing strategic plan was sunsetting, so it's a perfect opportunity to say what we do, how it work, what do we need to do to new and different, um, and move forward from there, and this will really guide the work for the district for the next five years. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to tell a quick little story. Um, now that I have a microphone in my hand, because it reminded me. So yesterday, um, Dr. Morris and I were out at schools, and we're leaving, um, I don't recall if it was Flag Street or Midland, but an elementary school. And the young man, probably a third grader, raises his hand, and he said, I've seen you. You're in the movies, huh? And I looked at him, and we looked at each other, and we said, but probably it was the news, but that's okay. <laughs> Let him think that I spoke. What did I say to him? I said, Well, I did live near Hollywood. Thank you for the microphone. Um, so, first, I want to thank Hanover Insurance for allowing us to use this beautiful facility, which is air conditioned. So, thank you. That's even more special. Um, very much appreciate it. And um, I want to thank the Worcester Public Schools team. I know I've got uh, Brian Allen here. Uh, Kate is somewhere. Just the people who are behind the scenes really making sure that this happened. I want to thank you for that. And then not to confuse things. So we have Hanover Insurance, who is providing the space. And then we have Hanover Research, who is um, going to facilitate this work. So thank you for jumping in with us and, and doing this with us. Um, it allows those of us in Worcester Public Schools to be participants and not to be the ones leading it and mostly to be listeners. So that's very, very helpful. Um, the At the end of today, you'll be clear on where we're going next in terms of uh, some work groups and what that looks like. Um, the most exciting part of where we at are in Worcester, where we are right now in Worcester Public Schools, I keep saying, we are in, um, I really think, I really feel this deep in my bones, um, a point in history where we are really starting to shift things just and it can shift really quickly together or it can shift really quickly and fall apart right and so I am so cognizant and the team is of doing this doing the shift that we know our children need in order to be successful for the future doing that with those who will be out in the community sharing the information um, those who may be future employers of our scholars, um, those who will be implementing the work, so the teachers, the principals, and the parents. It's so important that we're doing this together. So today is um, the start of that, and I'm grateful. So thank you, everybody, for taking time. Um, and, and I'll turn it over to, do I turn it over to our, our chair, Paul Matthews, who, we named him chair before he knew himself and said, oh, I heard I'm the chair. What does that mean, Dr. Hannah? <laughs> so thank you for being voluntold. Um, we appreciate you greatly. Thank you very much, Madam Superintendent, and for the honor of chairing the committee, which means basically all the coffee I can drink. I think, but thank you. Um, so just to say a few words on behalf of myself and uh, our vice chair, Jen Davis Carey, who is going to be arriving later this afternoon, I wanted to open by thanking the public schools and thanking the superintendent for committing to such a robust, engaged, and transparent process. Um, it's one that's vitally important, and I appreciate she's doing it so early in her tenure. Um, I want to thank her staff for everything they've done. I want to join and echo the thanks to my friend Kim Salmon in Hanover for hosting us today. Uh, Kim and I are both Worcester Public Schools alums, so this is very near and dear to our hearts. Uh, but most of all, I really want to thank all of you. Look, looking around this room, you all could be spending the day somewhere else. Maybe not air conditioned, but you could be somewhere else. And I, for one, just want to thank you for being here and committing to this process. Um, for those of you who do not know what the Research Bureau is, uh, of which I'm undoubtedly there are many of you, I am the Executive Director of the Research Bureau, which is a 37-year-old nonprofit in the city of Worcester that's dedicated to the mission of using data-driven research to help inform the public and policy makers of how to best address the complex issues facing the community. So the Worcester Public Schools have been a priority for the Research Bureau our entire organizational time. 
I'm the third executive director. My predecessor uh, worked on the strategic plan with Jen Davis Carey and REC in most public schools. I observed it as a parent. I was not at the Bureau. But the process itself clearly illustrated a few things. Number one, the importance of engagement. And, and all of you being engaged and committing to participating in this process is going to make it a much stronger plan. So I really do want to thank you. Um, I, I also want to point out that, as the superintendent, Brian, and the staff know, a part of this is transparency, which they've committed to, and, and tracking. And uh, you know, it's been a little challenging to take the previous plan and uh, try to utilize tracking. So I know that that's something that we're all committed to, so that there can be an ongoing conversation about the strategic plan, not just today, not just in its development, but its implementation. Um, I know my colleague Jen feels very strongly about that as well. I do want to read her statement as a courtesy. She asked me to, so let me, that's why I have paper with me. Um, She's conducting a training this morning for youth development professionals on the topic of trauma and learning, and so is unable to join us until this afternoon. She asked me to convey her enthusiasm and that of the Worcester Education Collaborative at being part of this important project that will bring us together to craft a path to assure that our kids receive the best education possible to prepare them for an increasingly complex world. Uh, I want to point out that the work we've done at the Bureau in the last few years since I arrived in 2019 has really focused on the challenges of the Worcester Public Schools. We worked with the schools to do a series of reports identifying the return to school, uh, school by school data, race, ethnicity, age, that really revealed some alarming disparities and inequities. We have done reports on the budget and on governance, as well as the tracking of the strategic plan. Uh, so, the Bureau itself is committed to working with the administration, working with the school committee, working with all of you to provide what resources we can. But I think it's important to note, I I'm here as an individual as well. We all have our own personal prisms, as well as the organizations we're here representing. As I mentioned, I'm an alum. I went to Flag, Forest Grove, and Darty. I'm also the proud father of two alums, one from Worcester Tech and one this spring from Darty. So I'll be representing that perspective as well, and I think we should all keep in mind the different perspectives we bring to bear here. Because at the end of the day, we're all going to be critical not just in developing the plan, but in its implementation. And right now, the Worcester Public Schools has 45 schools, 25,000 students, and more than 70 languages. So look, that's the situation today. It's only going to get more challenging and more complex. So if I could just ask everyone to please remember uh, what we're here to do today and through this process is to stay focused on the students and the students of today, but also the students of tomorrow and help guide the superintendent and her team in the Worcester Public Schools in anticipating where the priorities should go to serve those students. So I, for one, am honored to be here and I want to thank all of you and I look forward to a robust discussion and process. Um, so, always excited to be in front of a group kicking off a strategic planning process. It's a really important time, and it's something that can really make a difference, and I can feel the passion and belief in this room, um, which makes me even more excited. So today is going to be the first of an intense four months of digging into what is next in the next five years. So today we're going to be going through reflections, we're going to be giving you information, and we're going to be setting up the work for the next time that we come together towards the end of the month. So our introductions. So we are honored um, to be the facilitators of this process for you. It is an honor we don't take lightly. We take it serious because we deeply believe in the work of strategic planning and we believe that it is what helps move our students, all of our students, forward. So what's not in my bio is that I started um, my career in the Department of Youth Services in Brewster, which meant that I got to know your community in a very different lens than many people do because I can still see the faces of the boys and a couple of girls that came to our program through the courts that were struggling in your community. And they taught me a certain side about Worcester. That was actually my introduction, um, aside from hearing a little bit about you as a profile since um, my family is, is from Boston. But then, 
in higher education, I heard about your community because of your elite and wonderful higher education system. And now in education, I'm learning about all of that that is what is connected. Um, and I think that's perfect for strategic planning because again, we are talking about affecting all students and not forgetting about any of those that are sometimes not seen um, in our aggregated data or not forgetting to understand where they're going next and why we're moving them forward. Um, so really looking forward to being here with you through this process. So what has been said, the passion in this room already is just amazing. And who's here? Like I really admire who's in this room. So I know I'm sort of flipping the script here. I'm not starting with who I am, but I'll get there. Um, just already really uh, so taken by the effort to really pull together the community and have the community represented in such important work. So let me dovetail that back to who I am. I'm a lifelong educator. I'm somebody who spent a full career, 35 years, working for public schools. Uh, 10 of those as a teacher, 10 of those as a school psychologist. Uh, and then the remaining part is a building administrator, assistant principal, principal, and central office work. And particularly, the last part of my career focused on equity. So I heard so much of what was said today being about equity. Um, and I think if we are really honest with ourselves, the work of public education is about equity and trying to meet the needs of every child. So I love that that came through clearly. And I guess that's what I would want to be known for in this room and in this work. Um, I came to work for Hanover to be able to continue supporting public schools. And I'm here today to hopefully help this group to get to some honest dialogue about what their aspirations are for the children of Worcester. I'm from right down the road in Connecticut. I live just outside of Hartford. That's where my, my work has been. So this is a passion of mine, and I, I'm happy to be here to just do what I can to support you all. <laughs> All right. Um, my name is Marian Oeda. I am the managing director of our professional services arm at Hanover. So for those of you that don't know what we do at Hanover, we are a research and consulting firm that supports school districts around the country, um, really trying to build the capacity of district leaders um, as they engage in strategic planning priorities, whatever that priority is, through research and um, consulting advising services. So I have the honor and privilege of working every day with Anne and Scott, and I will obviously echo their sentiment as how honored that we are just to be here today and support you all through this process. Um, like Scott, I, I worked in district office. I actually started off as a secondary English and ESOL teacher, small school district in Northern Virginia, ended up becoming a literacy coach at the secondary level um, back when that was the new thing to do. Um, and then worked at central office as their district literacy and ESOL specialist. So my background and my passion is around uh, literacy and ed leadership, um, but in, in various roles, but a lot of the research that I've conducted in my work has been around equity and social justice. So for me, that's what I would like to bring to the table um, as well. So nice to meet you all. We're excited to, to be here. So you have this at the table. Uh, we have a, an agenda. Um, and we have uh, a fair amount of work to accomplish today, but we want to make sure that we're thoughtful about it. We don't want to rush it. Um, we want to make sure that it's done in a way that there are norms built, that there are clear, clear understanding of the goals of the work uh, and what this work looks like, as well as who's in the room. So uh, we are going to start with norms in a moment. I'll tell you a little bit more about that momentarily, but the, the day is set up such that that's where we're going to begin. But we're going to then move into the work. Right. What is it? We want to sort of start with a little bit of table setting about the strategic planning process and the roadmap that we have set out for this work so that people are clear. Again, we're really trying to join you in the transparency here that this is work that everybody is co-constructing, but we have a, a frame that we like to offer. Um, and then a review of the current strategic plan. We want to dig people in. It's, we felt it important to begin by looking back to look forward. Where have we been? Where is Worcester? Uh, establish some goals and aspirations for its schools and its children in its previous iteration and as we move forward, how do we build from it? And then a vision of the learner and the framework we, the district folks are going to talk a bit about, it. again, part of that vision. What do they expect? What does it look like uh, when one walks out the door at the end of, you know, all the years in the public schools here? What does a, a learner, what skills does that learner possess? What uh, aspirations and attitudes do they have about life and where they fit in? and their framework for instruction. Um, again, making sure there's a level playing field, that all folks in the room 
people coming from different walks of life, making sure that everyone's attuned to some of the framing that the district has provided around instruction and, and what it means to meet the needs of all children. And then we're going to end up by establishing priority work groups for the various district priorities. And so people can then dig in a little more deeply in each of those priority areas. So that's the plan for the day. Uh, as you've already seen, sometimes we were in a little flex based on where we need to go, but we do want to make sure we accomplish what we came here and were asked to do. So I did say we were going to set some norms, and so we're going to ask you to do that. We don't want to presume norms, uh, but we feel as an organization, and as we do this work, that norms are, are vital to the work. We're bringing together a community coalition here and establishing how we do the work and some balance around how we do have dialogue, what it means to talk honestly. Uh, we have different folks coming in from outside agencies, we have internal folks, and we need to make sure that we are able to talk to one another to meet what I've heard already are the important goals of this work, which is to meet the needs of every child and every family in the community. So that calls for us to really be thoughtful. So we're gonna start by asking you to think about what the norms are that you believe are most important in having this dialogue. Uh, so at your tables, we're going to ask you to, just so you know what's on your tables, if you haven't seen these, there are little packets for each table that have some supplies. Um, and we have some sticky notes, we have some markers, we have some highlighters in here for you to use. For this um, part of our morning, we're going to ask that you take um, the sticky notes and that you, as a group, discuss before you move into anything else. What's some vital norms? Are? Many of your organizations probably have norms. For today, though, for this work, given what the mission of this group is, what do you believe would be two to three norms that are really important? And then we're going to post those and discuss and agree to some norms as we move through this process. But just, um, first of all, the, the dialogue continues to be very honest and, and, and very sincere, which bodes well for this process and speaks to the fact that some of these norms are already somewhat in place. But um, some larger themes that look like they emerged. One, assume positive intent, which I don't know if anybody from any of the groups feels they want to elaborate on that. But I think it's a wonderful norm to be able to think about. We have differences of opinion, but it's, it's easy to fall prey to locking up as opposed to assuming someone's coming from a good place. Anybody feel like they want to add to that? But that's, a, that's a clear theme. Can I put Eric on the spot because he had such a great point. We were trying to figure out how to articulate it, if you don't mind. Um, just Sometimes you say something, I've worked with a lot of people and you, you, you're talking, I'm a big talker. And, um, <laughs> I mean when I say I say what I mean, I, and I try to make things as clear as possible. And sometimes people think you're, you're saying something when you're not. And how do you just say, look, this is, I don't mean anything, there's nothing, no hidden agenda. You know, um, and that's just, you know, how do you make that clear? But you, I know, again, it's hard coming up with the right wording for just, we're all here for the same reason, we're all here to succeed, and there's, just blue is blue, you know? And I'll make sure you know which blue I've dealt with colors for many years in my life. And you'll know exactly which blue I'm talking about. And don't, don't, I don't want to say assume because there's so negative connotations to that, but trust, I mean, that's the right word, trust that I'm going to make it clear which blue I'm talking about. And don't worry, don't think that there are other blues involved. So, Absolutely, you nailed it. So I think it's just assuming public sense, assuming an agenda, but it comes down to trust. Trust the process, trust one another, and trust the agenda. The transparency through it. Well, I, I heard a few that sort of t that are up here as well. One was respect, and all of that entails. Uh, back when I was a classroom teacher, that was sort of my only rule: respect one another, respect the learning process, respect you know the place. So that one is here. And I also see that another piece that's up there are two more maybe that tie to it. One is put students at the center of all the dialogue. And that to me felt pretty vital. And I saw that from several groups. And then as also relates to it, several of you, I think it's probably the most common answer was be engaged and an active listener, which 
has some layers to it, right? I may not necessarily understand which blue you mean teal or do you mean you know sky blue, but I'm going to make sure I ask and try to understand so that I'm clear. So active listening was definitely on people's list. Okay. Ensuring that I'm here to understand. Uh, let's see what I'm missing. Lots about, uh, maybe this ties to the respect as well, uh, but empathy and compassion and leaning into this as work that's not easy and having empathy for all the folks in the community and all the children that are served by this work. I think that empathy, not uh, sympathy, uh, that's a distinction that maybe people want to make. We join. Sorry, you're going to hear the school psychologist and he come out. Uh, work that I care a lot about. But, um, and then I also heard, I saw another one here that in many groups people like, which is we may not have all the answers. And so there's some folks who um, phrase that around being, um, being comfortable with non-closure, right? That this may, may not necessarily be firmly concluded by the time this dialogue gets done, but we will get to a closer place. Did I capture the bigger pieces? Are there others that people feel like should be on this list? And by the way, part of this is it's great that we have a, this dialogue. It's important, but it's also important that we uphold what these mean, mean in the group. And it's done. that's done in a respectful fashion. We can disagree, and, and how we disagree is all where the, the money is, is, is how we do it. So uh, maybe that needs to be said as well. Other pieces that aren't up here that I don't want to speak Incorrectly, yes. Um, one piece that I thought we um, wanted to add was uh, being available to have the hard conversations, courageous conversations, not avoiding things. Thank you for that. That sounds like respect to me. But I think you, you, I'm glad you put words to it. This is not easy. You know, we're we're representing children, and sometimes. You know, someone said uh, to me once in a, me in a meeting that if you're not asking the questions of those you're not serving and you're not, that you're not serving well, then you're not doing your job. So sometimes this isn't comfortable. So thank you for that. Okay, any last thoughts before we move into some of the content? Yes. I just want to talk about a little bit about having hard conversations is for everyone to be able to feel safe. To have that conversation and so, so, um, so I think I heard you talk about compassionate. Um, can you say a little bit about that? Because I think that's helpful. Um, compassionate because... truth telling. Compassionate truth telling. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, for example, um, when he had talked about this is blue and that's it, uh, I'm telling the truth. But so in my eyes, I might say, what the heck do you mean this is blue? I see green. Right, but if I were to respond in that way, he would feel unsafe. And so I think part of really these conversations is to make a commitment to be safe. Mm -hmm. I love that distinction. I think that's wonderful. And this needs to be a safe space. If we're going to have an honest document and an honest set of guiding principles for the district, there has to be that honest dialogue in a way that people don't feel like, I can't say this because it's not a safe space. Yeah. Thank you. My name is John Yomijinian. I'm from the African community education program. And I thought it was important to make some comments on a some positive intent. It is really important to understand that because there are ways you want to make some comments about something based upon your experience or experiences will sort of trigger the way you present that. If I'm from a most traumatic situation, the way I'm going to present that is different from somebody who has not had that experience. So the way I'm going to present humanity in a way sort of derail the presentation, looking out for saying the tone of it, or trying to understand the message and think that it's more positive, but it's based upon the experiences that that person or group of people must have experienced for which they are making that presentation. It should not be assumed based upon the tone around the messages since out. So that's what I was about to mention there. Thank you so much, John. That was uh, what a great addition. So I think we have a good place to start. Uh, as this work moves forward, uh, we need to make sure that we 
live by these norms if we're going to get to a good place. Um, we'll help with some of that, but you also need, this is collective work, right? So it needs to be done as a group. And uh, as we move forward, if there are pieces that we feel in this group it feels need to be added, they'll tell us, and we can bring those back to the, to the floor. We're here to facilitate, we're here to not get in the way, we're here to try to draw you all in together to have this dialogue. So that's a great place to start, and we feel it's important to make sure we have this conversation before we move into the actual content. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Anne. Thanks, those are great comments. You can't tell someone that it's a safe place, we have to show it. So, we have these norms. We didn't just do this exercise because it's most expected. We did it because we want to make sure it means something. Because we've never seen a strategic planning process that goes well and is meaningful and produces a plan for success without hard conversations, without tension, without a lot of discussion. So we do these norms because we're asking you to engage in a process where we're asking you for your voice and your voice and your, your perspective from that experience and knowledge that you're coming from might be directly different from somebody else because of their experience and their education. So then that means we have to know how to manage the differences, which I know I have to work a lot at, right? But environment and the group matters for how we respond and being able to ask those questions. So I hope that you come by and look at those norms. We will um, write these up so next time they are nice, big, and bright. Um, but please walk by the, the norms and see what everyone wrote and really think about how do you contribute to it.